is the BBC Home Service. As listeners to our early morning bulletins will have heard, Norway is at war with Germany. His Majesty's government and the French government have at once assured the Norwegian government that they have decided forthwith to extend their full aid to Norway. In the early hours of April the 9th, 1940, Nazi Germany launched a great surprise attack on Norway. The Norwegians, like so many others before them, were quite unprepared for this act of aggression. Nevertheless, they fought desperately with the other Allied forces for two long months to defend their own country. Eventually, however, with the fall of France, the Allied forces had no other choice but to withdraw from Norway. This withdrawal quickly set in motion the British government's sponsorship of the secret naval operation known as the Shetland Bus, which aimed to provide Norwegian resistance groups with munitions, radio operators and secret agents through the use of a regular ferry system between Shetland and occupied Norway. Whilst the outstanding heroism of the men involved is already well documented, this is the story of how the operation was undertaken and what its significance was to the Second World War. Well, the Shetland bus uh, really, I suppose, began in 1940, just after Norway was occupied. At first, of course, it was an unofficial uh, operation. It, it only got organised in uh, later 1940 and into 1941. It started off in Lerwick and then it moved to Lana. Lerwick was not a very satisfactory base for a secret operation. Lerwick was very busy. Lana was attractive because it seemed to have all the requirements of uh, secrecy, uh, an excellent anchorage. We chose Lana first of all because it was a first-class harbour, very well sheltered from all directions. Secondly, it had a huge old house, which was uh, big enough for all 50 of us to cram into. Life there was um, oddly lonely and yet intensely exciting. Uh, after the first winter at Lana, they realised that um, repairs were a big problem. They could not get effective repairs done. There were other problems too because Lana could not be defended and uh, they did fear an air attack. So they came here in 1942 to Scalloway and this is where they stayed until the end of the war. Once the operation had moved to Scalloway, its second base, there became a number of key locations within the village which were crucial. Yeah, the, when, the, when the slip was, was built, uh, it was finished in, I think, 1942. I was six years old. My grandfather took me down to see the opening and he lifted me up on his shoulder so that I could see across the heights of the the people that was there, and uh, so I saw the Prince Olaf as he was then unveiling the, the, the plaque. It's still on the wall yet. Yeah, my father, uh, Jack Moore, had the engineering business here in Scalloway, which um, was what they so badly needed, because these boats were coming back from Norway uh, in pretty poor state of repair, as you can imagine. We went there entirely because there was Jack Moore's workshop, which was exactly what we needed. And Jack himself was the hardest worker I've ever met in my life. He never knocked off till midnight, and he was always back on the job at seven o'clock in the morning. One morning, a few other uniformed officers arrived down at the shop and asked if they could have a look around. And I said, yes. So they did. And Come back a half an hour after and they said this was just what they were looking for. I said, well, you can have it. Whilst the operation was carried out more smoothly from the Scalloway base, it's important we understand who the men involved were and why they chose to take part in such a serious endeavour. My granddad came from a village called Telewog, 
This is in Norway, West Norway. In the island there, the shopkeeper was keeping two uh, people up in the loft. They were hiding two people from the Gestapo. Uh, the Gestapo came over and they found the two people. Uh, a fight broke out. The two Gestapo officers got shot. This was bad news for the Germans because this was high up officers. And they came back and they burnt down the whole village. All the men were sent to uh, camps and uh, the, all the women and children were sent away to a school uh, a few hours away. He obviously wanted to do something for a fight for his country, so he, his brother owned a, a fishing boat, so him and his, some of his friends took the fishing boat and came over to Shetland. It was one of those really interesting operations, you know, soon after the fall of Dunkirk and the fall of Norway, trying to encourage Norwegians to resist. I did it because the Germans was coming here and we hadn't anything to order to do. At the beginning of the war, we had the Germans walking the streets in my hometown. I didn't very much like it, so I decided to get into the forces. They were filled with a burning desire to do what they could to get their country back. After being accepted into the mission, the men had to mentally prepare for the crossings they would participate in. The trips themselves were fraught with peril, and for many, it was their first experience participating in a covert operation. Well, they were dangerous missions. These were young lads, they were volunteers. These were winter operations, so the weather was absolutely foul, um, normally, and uh, they had to go very long distances. Some trips were up to the Arctic. So that entailed about a five-day trip with only a compass in the middle of winter. So it was astonishing that they, they were able to achieve as many trips as they did. And in some ways, it's hard to say which was the worst enemy, the weather or the Luftwaffe, because both were a major threat. The danger, well, it was facing the roughest possible seas for the first thing, and of course, an absolutely ruthless enemy as well. They had to get into the patrol zone in Norway uh, under cover of darkness, and then they could, in the fishing boat era, they could pretend to be fishing. They could use their disguise. So in order to get through German defences, once they got over to Norway, they had to be absolutely up to date with any passwords, uh, any new border controls that had been introduced, so that they could never be uncovered through some kind of mistake. We brought to Norway mostly aliens from the Linge company who should do several uh, sorts of jobs. For example, uh, telegraphists uh, and saboteurs and, and people who were going to train uh, the boys at home. And we brought ammunition and stores for the aliens and that was it. What they brought out was information and refugees. Over the course of the war, they saved over 300 refugees and they brought in more than 300 tonnes of wartime material. Some of the trip was very hard, some of the trip was easy. But um, I must say I was very lucky. Whilst all of the men involved in the mission have been admired for their bravery, there were certain figures whose heroism stood out among the rest. This is my grandfather here and some of his medals so he got for, for taking part in the shuttle bus. And he actually did something like 56 trips over. And the only one he missed was the day he got married in the Church of Scotland in Scalloway. So he couldn't, he couldn't go on his mission. I remember most of all the skippers and um, particularly Life Larsen. He'd fought uh, in the Finnish war and he was a man whom instinctively other men would follow. I don't know what to say about that, but I knew the job, you see, and uh, I was very keen on it, and uh, so it went off that way. He was awarded so many British decorations that he actually had 
more British decorations than any other foreigner, and he had a wider range of British decorations than any Brit. I and a few others went through it all during the time we were uh, going with fishing boats, but we lost uh, 42 men at that time, and uh, eight of our boats we lost too. So we had uh, other heavy losses. The men faced danger on a daily basis, so it was inevitable that some of the volunteers' experiences came to a premature and sad end. A fact underlined in this poignant extract from the memoirs of the late Harriet Johnson, a resident of the village. My sister Milly had a Norwegian boyfriend called Olaf, an extremely nice, quiet fellow. He had flaxen hair and very blue eyes. Alas, he lost his life when the boat he was in was attacked and sunk. This happened at New Year, and it was very sad New Year for all of us. We had known Olaf well, and also some of the boys who were with him. There was one dreadful tragedy when a boat called Blea went down and was lost forever, carrying 11 crew and 37 refugees, all of whom lost their lives in one atrocious scale. She was never found. Uh, the winter of 1942 was exceptionally uh, bad. There were many uh, men lost. And by um, the beginning of 1943, 44 men had been lost and about eight boats. And the decision had to be made, can they carry on? Was the, the cost too great? There were some men whose, whose nerve broke. We could see it was happening. And we'd take them off and, and, and uh, send them on, on long leave. Sometimes they came back and sometimes not. I and my British colleagues protected them. We first received orders from London. And we considered each one as to whether it was really feasible, too much of a risk, before we proposed it to the men. We never put them in a position uh, where they reasonably could have refused, knowing them as we did. The men wanted faster craft. They, they were still very, very willing to, to take part in the operations. They said, could they not be supplied with better craft than these slow fishing boats? We had nothing to offer. We had motor torpedo boats, but they were not very good in the North Sea in winter. And we'd almost given up hope when suddenly Admiral Nimitz, the American Admiral, said, I know just the very thing of you boys. And he sent over on a merchant ship three US Navy submarine chasers, 110 feet long, the most complicated electronic gadgetry that you could possibly imagine. And we suddenly had to change from fishing boats to running these things. From the end of 1943, they took over the role of the fishing boats. Now, you cannot disguise one of these sub-chasers. They were, as I say, mini-destroyers. It still was a winter operation, and although they could no longer be fishing boats in disguise, uh, they could still get to the coast of Norway under cover of darkness. And by that time, we had more radio operators. We had more intelligence about the state of affairs of what the Germans were doing in Norway. And this uh, special day we were playing down in two rock pools just out there and we had engines and when we got up to look then there were three boats, grey boats coming in very fast and that was when the sub chasers came for the Shetland bus. Well that's that's the channel they were coming yeah. in, you see, yeah. coming in past it. So we never really thought it was anything to worry about, but we knew there was something something on, <laughs> you know. And of course we didn't know, know it was for the Shetland boss, it was just three warships coming in. You know. And once we had them, the operations became so much easier that they really ceased to be a story at all. Mm -hmm. It was just like a, a, a trading run across Norway. 
and we had no casualties at all. So they really became the Shetland bus. After the successful conclusion of the operation, there is no doubt that it had a significant effect on the morale of occupied Norway. The Shetland bus undoubtedly had an a effect in occupied Norway. It gave them a, a lifeline for escape. And they were the ones who originally coined the phrase to take the Shetland bus, meaning to escape. But I think it was even more important that the existence of the Shetland bus kept up the spirits of the Norwegians at home in Norway. They always knew that, come what might, they were not entirely cut off from the free world. Certainly nothing like it had ever been done before. And I can hardly imagine it ever will again. Because you've got to remember that between 1940 and 1944, there is no real kind of Western power fighting its way through Europe. So at that point in time, it's all about stories of hope and of opportunity and, and little stories of success. And so establishing that connection with resistors in Norway and, and offering that lifeline, I think, was really an important part of the story in 1940 to 1944. I think the Shetland bus um, maintains the ties that Shetland has held with Norway over the centuries. The Shetland bus revived those ties. And not only the Shetland bus, but uh, the wartime in general, because there were so many Norwegians stationed here in Shetland, probably somewhere in the region of uh, 750. There were at least 20, 22 marriages, I think, between Norwegians and Shetlanders during the war. And of course, that reinforced the ties. When we talk about the Shetland bus, it's important we understand what was its significance overall within World War II and what will that legacy carry on to future generations. It was one of those um, operations which, um, in terms of numbers of people and in terms of kind of military significance, may be not as important as others, but at the same time it had a real value and worth, I think, to the people of Norway and for that sense that there was a connection with what was at that point the sole remaining Allied power. The facts are that it kept 10 divisions of Germans occupied in Norway. Now that's about 280,000. Some of the Norwegian writers say that in practice there were half a million German either military or, or associated personnel tied up in Norway. Now that's an awful lot who, had they been deployed elsewhere, could have changed the course of the war. So perhaps the Shetland bus did uh, play an important role. Even today, we have many eminent people from Norway coming to visit Shetland, coming to honour the links between those two places. When the Shetland Museum was opened in Lerwick in 2005, it was opened by Her Majesty Queen Sonia of Norway. When the Scalloway Museum was opened in 2012, which tells a lot about the Shetland bus story itself, it was opened on Norway's National Day by the Prime Minister of Norway himself. The legacy of the Shetland bus operation is very much connected to the legacy of the Second World War more broadly. And now, 70 years distant from the conflict itself, this is a moment in which communities across Britain and Europe are really interested in finding and refinding at times those events and those episodes of the 20th century which link them to the grand events of, uh, of the last century or so. So I think the Shetland bus story is part the, of the Shetland story of the 20th century and part of, of the British story of the Second World War. And I think the legacy of that will likely continue for the foreseeable future. But it wasn't just a huge adventure. It wasn't just young men, because mostly they were very young, getting to grips with nature and the enemy. It was something far more than that, I think, and this was the refusal to give in to adversity, the belief in freedom, the acceptance of ultimate risks to preserve and defend those freedoms. Norway had lost her freedom, of course, and I'm so proud that Britain and my father helped her to recover it. Scattered are her 
persons and daughters. 